Typically a Kaizen event is a short duration, a short period of time where you do rapid improvements. It's uh, analogous to if you were going to eat the elephant, maybe take the whole leg in, in four days and then you're left with action items at the end of the event. So it's very episode or we say episodic type of improvement events. Kata is a routine for practicing and becoming a part of your daily continuous improvement um, uh, culture. It's taking small steps, so maybe just a small bite of the elephant. The five questions keep you focused and targeted on how do you want this process to operate in the next week or two weeks out and what obstacles are keeping you from operating in that target condition. We sit back and look at the current situation and then develop experiments or PDCA cycles to try and go around those obstacles to get one step closer to that target condition. Every day a step closer, a step closer, and all of this is in line with the vision and the challenge for the company. All right, good morning everyone. Uh, today's guest uh, that I have on is Mark Rosenthal. Uh, Mark is a long time uh, lean thinker. Uh, as his website says, and a, uh, a longtime Kata practitioner, as well as many other um, improvement processes. Um, welcome, Mark. Glad to have you on. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So, um, Mark, talk to us a, a little bit about what, what a lot of our Kata practitioners, and I think both you know, in the community that, that go to KataCon, as well as those that are out practicing you know, as a, as a result, and that keeps growing. Talk us about your beginning journey um, as you, you've been in lane for several years and, and throughout your career. Uh, and then the, there was a point where you read the book. I think you said you took the um, University of Michigan course with uh, Beth Carrington as the instructor. And there was some takeaways and some some ideas that started to, to come come together for you. So talk to us about yeah. your, your I mean, journey. Just to just to rewind, I got into lean formally like in 1989 when I was uh, working at Boeing and uh, we were going through this iteration and that iteration as, uh, as the whole company was trying to find a path. And uh, eventually we uh, ended up in uh, Shingajitsu land. Ah. And so I was uh, steeped in it that way. My last two years there were taking the lean workshops, classic Kaizen events out to the supply base. And that's kind of where I cut my teeth in doing consulting work. Just, right. you know, just throw them into the deep end of the pool and <laughs> <laughs> have them go with it. Um, and uh, then I went to a company called Genie Industries in uh, that builds all the blue scissor lifts out there. And uh, we, Shingajitsu came in behind us because a lot of us from Boeing kind of landed there over a period of about three or four months. And, uh, and so I was really steeped in that, that classic Kaizen event model. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we were working really, really hard on trying to get it, trying to get a good escalation system in and trying to get daily Kaizen of some kind in. Um, and just to just to continue the story, I got recruited as a lean director at Kodak back when it was a big company. Shingajitsu was in there, uh, and we had a blinding flash of insight that it wasn't sticking very well because we were actually pushing supervisors aside and doing it all for them. Oh, okay. which is I think what the I've... classic. The classic Kaizen event does, right? Been, you send in been the there. experts. Yeah, yep, yeah. been there before, yep. Um, and so we we started, I, I call it kata on bearskin rugs and stone tablets. It was a, a cruder version of it, but this idea of engaging problem solving on a daily basis. And uh, I, I'm proud to say that, you know, I know a couple of places in that company, that was all back in 03, 04, and I know a couple of places that are still doing it. So whatever happened stuck. Great. Um, so you know, fast forward a bit. Um, I'm back at Dini's now parent company, Terex, a recession's hitting. I'm kind of turning the lights off in the <laughs> improvement office. And, uh, um, you know, the Toyota Kata book uh, kind of fell in my lap and uh, I read it. And my insight was, oh, this is this is a really good structure for what we've been doing, but could never explain to anybody. Right. Because we all learned to do coaching the way that you learned it in Japan. And, um, and so I struggled with it a bit and tried to apply it with clients and other companies and, uh, and finally took the, 
took the kata class from, at the time, you mission. It was taught by uh, Beth Carrington. And that's really when the light came on about the structure and mm-hmm. especially the grasp of the current condition part. Because uh, right. what I loved about that was that in a few hours, I could get 80% of what it was taking me three days to do and prep for a traditional Kaizen event, which was just enough to know where I needed to start. Yeah. So- sounds kind of like uh, some of my be- my beginnings in Oh, around the 98 period or so, uh, we had some consultants come in, the company I was working at, Waterloo Industries, and taught the first Kaizen value stream mapping uh, type event and then wanted to know at the end of that session who was going to be the champion for this. And our plant manager turned around and (laughs) pointed to me in the second row and and announced (laughs) my name. And I guess I got anointed. Uh, Sir, yeah. Sir Kaizen man yeah. at that company and several events and a lot of things didn't stick. I had other uh, industrial engineers help, helping me and picking up the to-do list as you, as you were talking about yeah. uh, after them, I would stay for, but I had to plan the next event, you know, it was like a calendar yep. that we had going and yes, the people and they would say, uh, Oh yeah, that, that, that Kaizen stuff, uh, that comes around, you know, in October and in, in May, it's almost like they were yeah. referring to a holiday calendar, St. Patrick's day and Labor day. We get, we yeah, get, yeah, yeah. The people, when people get really good at it are the workshop <laughs> leaders because they're yeah. the ones doing it all the time. Right. And the people put on the white suits, paint everything, clean everything, rub the grease off. And uh, yeah. I went to those one company, I, I was allowed to join in and they were doing uh, multiple Kaizen events every summer. It was like, uh, second week in June or third week in June, right before their July shutdown. And it was very quickly apparent that the second day, like you said, the people were pushed to the side and out comes the prototype of a die. They were a forging oh. company and a die comes out. that's already been made Yeah, and parts were made off of it and given to the operator to see how it would fit into the fixture. Um, which didn't fit very well. And that's when I first realized, I said, this was all done before. This wasn't coming from the people. And they said, well, we, we can't get any capital approved unless it falls under the Kaizen budget. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I took the, the three-day course down at Carter Blood Care um, back in 2011, maybe. Uh, mm-hmm. that Beth taught, two other people were there. Mike taught the first day and uh, I was kind of lost, head spinning a little bit. I hadn't had a chance to read the book before because it was kind of a approved yes go really quick uh, to the to the workshop. And then after about the first hour, he started talking about episodic events and Kaizans and four days in a pizza party. And we're not, we're not good here in the U.S. at doing it on a daily basis yeah. at that particular time. And I was like, where has been the hidden camera that he's been following me around because this is exactly what I've been struggling to do. So I can, I can relate very much to what you were saying about um, the Kaizen thought, the Kaizen event, nothing wrong with Kaizen itself, the Kaizen event, you know, three days, four days, pushing the people to the side. That's uh, the deployment doesn't work uh, when you, yeah, you when think you about that. it. What do you leave? What are you left with? Monday morning is an untested target condition. Mm-hmm. And the supervisor in that area who may have been involved on the team, but wasn't really doing all the experiments himself to get that to work is now tossed into the deep end and all the support moves on to the next one. So no wonder it erodes because all he knows how to do is to put back the systems that got taken out because they were all there to protect him from all those problems. Right. right. And um, maybe I'll mention, I'll talk a little bit here later on. I'm uh, scheduled to talk to Andrea Simpson at NEA with the uh, Get mm-hmm. Better Jump Start and the Kata Jump Start that we've kind of talked about. We'll maybe get into that just a, a little bit. So, um, so yeah, after that, of that class, it was, it was mainly ca- how to capture current uh current condition there was a it was a blood center they uh had centrifuges six a six person six station uh centrifuge and they separate the plasma and then the uh, um, platelets and then all the different things go into different kinds of racks and we were time studying them and um 
then going back, trying to build, they were trying to coach us to build the first storyboard, but it was, it was difficult not understanding or have read the book prior to going to it. That, that was my uphill challenge on that particular three day. We came back and was working for Arkansas Manufacturing Solutions at that point, the state MEP. Mm -hmm. And that's when we, I pulled a couple of veteran practitioners, Bill Krauss uh, and Lauren Berry, some of those guys who had been doing the buzz electronics for years. And I said, hey guys, what if we took round three where we already have it in a cell or in a line and we apply the Kata current condition to heart condition challenge to that portion? And I think the MEP is using that or, or, or launching that caught in a box as Mike calls it uh, yeah. right now. So, but more back, more back to you. Um, so you first started using it. Where did you first started using it as your way of, from a CI director standpoint, your way of uh, improving or, 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 or coaching and teaching the, the frontline folks? Really when I got into consulting, uh, okay. He has typically uh, people would say, Hey, we want some Kaizen events. So that's just, you know, that's time, time on the shop floor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I would structure it using the Kata structure. Okay. We're here's, here's the challenge for the team. Let's go grasp the current condition. And then we establish a target condition. And the difference was that by on Monday morning, instead of saying, okay, we're done. And I would say that's when the Kaizen starts. And the expectation, which was laid out ahead of time, was that on a daily basis, they would go through the questions on this card and continue to work. So what they've got on what they've got on Monday morning is they've got a target condition. They may have hit one and they've got another and they have the next experiment and the next obstacle. And the idea then was just keep working on it rather than here's a whole here long list of action items to get done. And once you get two done, things have changed and none of the rest are relevant anymore. Yeah. That, I think you'll hear the same thing when I interview Andrea about her get better jumpstart. We, we worked together was that that whole three days was grasping the current condition, doing several PDSAs yeah. really to understand and in order to set the target condition, then the storyboard and the topic challenge gets moved on Monday to, okay, now we're going to pick it up and start with the daily continuous improvement yeah. part of it. So very, very similar. Um, how successful is that? Did you have uh, companies that jumped on board? Do you have other companies you had to kind of coax into it or? Uh, the ones I was working with, I mean, one of them was a, a silicon wafer fabrication plant and that was a classic worst to first situation for them. Mm. So it was, they're still going pretty strong. And, uh, you know, the classic, uh, everything was late and, you know, they went, I think, uh, six months, they had one late lot that was an engineering lot that got lost in an eddy somewhere. <laughs> uh, but, you know, dissecting the flow in that was challenging because it's not linear flow, it's circular. Um, yeah. But it was, uh, it worked really well there. And again, they still have a pretty strong culture of improvement. So I'd say it's sticking. Very good. Very good. Um, any places that you learn from? that that didn't go so well that you say maybe at the end of it you reflect back and said maybe we could have done this a little differently or or maybe that people didn't understand the concept i know sometimes i we try and do the dominoes or we try and do some kind of introductory type of awareness but then we come away and it seems like 50 percent of the people say you know when i got when i got the card in my hand when i got the card and i got in front of the board it all came together uh, in the domino class other people say even though they did that, they could not put it together with what, um, what they were doing out on the floor because the whole time they're preoccupied with what's, you know, what's the current state of how they work, not yeah. learning the new process. Yeah. So yeah. They you, get really good at setting dominoes. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what did you, uh, what, what's been your experience? Um, it, what I'll say is where I could tell you that, you know, where it's set up to fail is when the leaders send their people to get trained. Because they because I've probably done a bad job of telling them you're the ones who have to be the coaches. Because you can't delegate that. Right. Uh, 
but you get that a lot, especially if you run, if, if, you know, especially in the case of public classes. Um, even though it's geared toward management, I mean, the whole introductory part is this is how you manage. Uh, but uh, people get sent to be trained. And uh, in the, you know, the, the immortal words of the great philosopher, Rocket J. Squirrel, that trick never works. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I see that. I try to push back on it pretty hard. Uh, but you have to start where they are. Yeah. And end up with frustrated people. Then we go back to leaders and we make them or try to get them to come out for the coaching cycles. And I'll hand them a card and say, how about you asking the questions? And right. just getting them to step into it. In some of those cases, you know, the, the learner knows more about it than the coach does. But I just need the coach to go through the motions and learn to be curious. Right. Steve Medlin sometimes relates those training events to um, a college or university wants to start up a golf team and in the next year and they get the assistant baseball coach because it's real similar. You're swinging yeah. a stick at a ball <laughs> and uh, you, you go ahead and, and do you, if, even if you don't play, go to the golf course a couple, two or three times and then go in the clubhouse and get a couple of lessons and then come back and train us. And then, yeah, read then we'll this book about golf. <laughs> yeah. Then we'll read a book about golf. Um, we may, we may go out to the course and watch you from the, from the balcony out back, but we're not going to swing a stick. And, and, um, and then we're going to hire or recruit in all these golf players to come play on our collegiate golf team. And <laughs> it just doesn't work yeah. that way when leadership's not engaged in doing it. So, you know, one of the things I try to start with is it's not, kata per se, although it's a big part of it, is spending time with a leadership team saying, these are the things that are your responsibility. And, you know, I put them in ways that you can go out on your shop floor and see if you're doing them or not. Right. And it's really about how you're insisting that processes be structured as a leader, what you're willing to walk past, what you're going to stop and intervene, how powerful are your escalation processes? Because if your system's running well and you don't have an escalation process, it'll start to deteriorate very quickly. Right. So, you know, what are the mechanisms that have to be there for it to sustain? And what yeah. mindset do you need? It, you're, what you're saying, it sounds so much like Beth's five factors, key, five key factors for uh, advanced groups or advanced groups to five key factors for success. I think is the title yeah. for slide share and right people in the right roles, I think is one mm -hmm. is number three or, or we just covered that. I just interviewed her a few weeks ago yeah. on that one. Cause that's been the most influential slide share on, on my learning. And you're saying, right. and you're saying the same thing. You got to have the leadership in the right roles and, I, and start yeah. that way. They've got to be leading by setting challenges. They've got to be leading by developing their people. Uh, they've got to make sure the processes are, are um, what's the word I use? The processes are designed to tell you if they're working well or not. You've got to have uh, some process of escalation, of seeing problems, stopping, calling for help, and a process of then resolving that issue. And Kata ties in really well with all of that. Right. Because how do you do it? You do it by coaching people. Exactly. Exactly. And, and they can't leave that responsibility once just because they've been through those roles. Yeah. They, it, the, yeah. The, the most difficult ones are the ones who say, yes, I understand that. And I have to be a learner before I can be coach. My eventual hope is to get to be a second coach. I understand all that. But then they get the second coach for two or three target conditions. And then business as usual starts to pull them away. And, and unless they, they have an the external coach, yeah. then they're left to, to feed for themselves without having the second coach there. So that's, that makes it difficult sometimes. Well, you think about it, it's the same thing for a process. You have to have an and on mechanism, mm -hmm. which means you have to have something supervising the coaching process in order to tell if it's going right or not. That's no different than that assembly line taking 55 seconds or taking a minute two. All right. In advanced groups, I think of what we've, what Beth's work in that area and my work at uh, Baptist with Skip likes to call them shepherding groups mm -hmm. um, is they've turned that into that, that mechanism. They don't just mm -hmm. leave a group. They, they are a, what they call a shepherd or advanced group member, but they're also a, a second coach and they're responsible mm -hmm. for certain teams. Um, 
and they, they'll, they'll admit they get, they get stuck. They get frustrated at certain times. And if they go to look at it, that particular, uh, advanced group, shepherd group person admits, Hey, I've not been spending, uh, once or twice a week with them. I've had this, 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 and going mm-hmm. on and, and I, I'll, I need to do better. And then they usually what, jump, yeah. jump in and, and that takes them on. And what's your standard work? You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. That's the leader. Right. You, you mentioned, I think we, we talked briefly a little bit about sometimes you had to hijack their hijack, Kaizen events. I think what was the term that you used is, is that what you were talking yeah, about earlier well, about, you know, if there's an existing improvement structure, there's no reason to rip it out. Right. It's really a matter of smoothing in some tricks and tips that I'll take from Kata and just kind of work gently to reshape it rather than try wholesale change. You know, right. marching in and telling them that their long-standing improvement program is wrong probably isn't a good way to stay there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, starting to just gently morph it into a daily coaching process isn't all that difficult. And if they are finding that the kata words and vocabulary are too alien, then we'll use different ones. It's a matter of getting the practice of the thinking structure into place somehow. Right. So kata can inform that, but it doesn't have to be dogma. Right. Exactly. Can't hardline it as much. Um, so, so necessarily you wouldn't say you find yourself going into clients um, with the intent of, of, of deploying improvement kata and coaching kata many times. So I'm sure some people come to you and say, hey, we've read the book. We've tried it. Yeah. We need some help. But then there's yeah. the other set that, hey, we know you from Lean Thinker. Uh, we need you to come in and help us. And you may or may not go in with a deployment attitude, I guess. Is yeah, that a, they'll, a good yeah, assumption? They'll, they'll end up there. It's just a matter of starting where they are. Meeting people where they're at. Yep. Meeting where they're at. Um, another question I had for you, and I, I want to make sure I had the, the vocabulary right. You, I've talked a couple of times, and I think I've heard you at Katakan speak about it. Um, is, and you, again, correct me. You find yourself uh, and your clients going from, or yourself, going from consciously competent to unconsciously yeah. competent. Did I have that right? Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's that classic continuum of expertise from unconscious incompetence through conscious incompetence, conscious competence, where I know how to do it, but I have to be aware of my skill. And then the mastery is I'm not even, it's like driving, right? You know, you, you get home at the end of the day, you don't even remember taking the trip. Right. Uh, and what the what reading the Toyota Kata book did for me was it kicked me as a coach from unconscious competence back down to this is what I'm doing. Because unless I can break it down into the steps, I can't teach anybody else to do it other than just watch me. Right. And now, you know, there's that there's yeah. that graph at Drucker. Is it the Drucker? Um, the chart, Dreyfus? The, 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 no, well, no, there was the one where Mike put up at Katakan that uh, early on you feel like you're highly oh, competent. Oh, Dunning Kruger. Dunning Kruger. Yeah. Dunning Kruger. Yeah. yeah, the Dunning yeah. Kruger effect happens to a lot of people that start out with it, and then that yeah. has happened to us as practitioners as well. And you know, I think a lean practitioner, there's a critical point in about the two year mark where they're pretty good, and I, I've seen you know a fair number of them just stick with that because they stop challenging their own skill and they just keep doing what they learned and running workshops and they just keep doing it again. And they get to the point where they know what they know how to fix a process uh, very well. It's all second nature to them. And then you have some that every few years, they get some blinding flash of insight that, uh, Oh, I've been doing it wrong. And they change things up. And for me, reading Toyota Kata was one of those moments. You know, the one before it was reading a PhD dissertation by Steven Spear, (laughs) who wrote Decoding the DNA of the Toyota Production System, along with a couple of other things. And, you know, that was another insight into how TPS actually functions. Right. Exactly. So, Mark, over your coaching career um, and using some of the Toyota Kata principles, either whether it's bringing them in gently or whether you're brought in and where I'm brought in external coaches are brought in to, to help with it. Um, 
what signs, signals, or behaviors have you observed among companies um, that you start to see the end of their practicing or the end of the success of their practicing uh, insight? I've heard Beth talk a little bit about the death spiral sometimes, but what, um, what, are some of the, what are some of those behaviors that you see as early warning signs to maybe some of our audience that might be trying to practice or have been practicing and they could reflect and say, we're doing that. And that, and this uh, is so sick. you're, you're talking about signs of deterioration. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, target conditions that don't get updated or moving the date rather than changing the target, just continuing to work on the same thing every single day and nobody really is paying attention. All right. Um, it... Yeah. A project or an improvement or something else coming in that's okay. Outside the framework of Kata. Uh, but really, I want to flip the question on its head and ask, when do I know they're starting to run with it, too? Yeah. Which is when I hear their words change. Right. So what are some of those? What are the, what, how do you uh, hear that? Wait a minute. What problem are we actually trying to solve? And I'll quote that from Menlo Innovations. But when people start in meetings, start working to clarify the problem, start asking, what do we know? What do we need to learn? Uh, then I know the habit, the habitual thinking starting to get embedded into place. Right. How do we know? Have, have we tested that? How can we test that? That's the holy grail, isn't it? Right. Is uh, how can we test this idea? Exactly. Um, I've heard Tilo Swartz talk about three phases of coaching, and I've, I've experienced it too. Maybe you can relate to it is you, you start out, um, you get the board going this leadership has the challenge um, and and whether they rotate between being learner and coach and you have this matrix of, of sharing that that responsibility or rotating that responsibility yeah, he says it, a coach goes through three phases first it's the it's the card I, I'm, I'm trying mm -hmm. to get these five questions in the four on the back to flow and not mess up the rhythm and you're just literally skill building kind of at that yeah. point he said, then there's usually a point where, okay, I've got this down. Still encourage them to have it there. Use the rule of thumb. Keep your thumb on the question so you don't get lost. But now I'm starting to see the data and the information on the board that my learner's putting up there. So I'm not just looking at the card as a script. I'm relating it to the obstacles, the data in the current condition. What are we trying to strive for? And then he said, where you really want to get them to, and I've seen this and kind of relayed this to many of the of the clients is it's phase three where they see the learner and they're past looking the information they're seeing how the learner is speaking like you said the language mm -hmm. they're using toward the board and you start asking those clarifying questions or those deepening questions to make them think you know are they on the right track for the problem or are they spinning in a certain mm -hmm. which, but you see literally as skip would say inside the brain inside the thinking of the learner so is that have you seen those phases would you say that's that's typical or i'm gonna say it's i guess it is for the people who are who are actually working hard to learn it uh the yeah, the 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 flip side is dropping the card too soon or trying to casually ask the question without reading the card at first i see that they all that's where I, I, I have to step in and do a lot of correction exactly i do uh, too. please just read the question on the card exactly uh, and so it's probably not as neat as that uh, there's a lot of a lot of, of active guardrails that have to come into place but that'd be a pretty good corridor to try to get people to go down i'll put it that way it's not it's a good model for the second coach to have in mind Exactly. Where is my where is my coach right now? Right, and the storyboard is a reflection of where his learner is at at that particular point. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. The storyboard is a, a picture of the thinking. Yeah, I, I remember one. Uh, I think that has still had the level of superintendent or or plant manager, however you want to look at it. He had been there thirty something years, and he was he was seeing success. He was buying into it. He was, you know reaping the benefits uh, from an operation standpoint, but he still hadn't gotten off of the me say you do type mm -hmm. of a relationship instead of a coaching relationship. And, and it, and what, what caught me 
and you know, I can still remember it catching my ear. So how quickly can we go and see what we have learned from taking this step? He said, all right, when will you have that done for me? Yeah. And it, there was just silence. And not only did I throw the learner off yeah. because that's not the question on the card, you know, it just completely stopped the yeah. cycle of him trying to, okay, wh when can yeah. I commit to a date without getting myself in hot water? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It becomes an action item. Right. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Could you please read the question on the, well, I said, what did you catch yourself just there is what I first started. Yeah. I wanted to see if he caught himself and he said, no, yeah. I don't know what you mean. And I said, well, on the card, could you, could you read the last question? And he read it and he said, I asked, when will I have it done? And I said, mm -hmm. exactly. That's more the commanding control yeah. rather than focusing on the learning. When will we be able to come back to the board and see what we've learned, mm -hmm. both of us, you and I, yeah. uh, from this step? And from that point, I think he finally it clicked to him that the importance of the wording on the card in certain cases. Yeah, I know that question's gone under a lot of uh, parsing over the years. Yeah, that probably so. There's probably three three revisions or so of that yeah. that's that's happened. Um, so reflecting over, you said about the last 10 years or so of, of being a Cotter practitioner and incorporating it with your events, um, what would you say are the top few things on your list that Toyota Kata and Toyota Kata Coachings have, have taught you? If you had to just say, Mark, what are the top three things from reading the book, practicing it now, looking back over the last 10 years? One, two, and three. This, these are my main learnings and advice I would pass on to early practitioners. Or I'll say, I'm, what I'm still learning is, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, one of the analogies I use is uh, you know, if you're trying to learn algebra or calculus, the answer is four, but that doesn't help you. Uh, and you got to know how you got to four because that's what you're trying to learn. I'm not trying to learn how to solve this problem. I'm trying to learn how to solve general problems. And you know, all of us can walk into a factory and probably in, in a matter of a few minutes know where that factory needs to be in two years to be really, really good. Right. But and that's not the, the point. Start writing yeah, it down. <laughs> yeah, do this, do this, do this. Um, so learning that balance of when to drop a hint when to give an instruction to a learner to go look at something specific and come back and tell me what you saw. So a gentler version of Ono's chalk circle. Okay. Yeah. Uh, or sometimes draw a chalk oval. Okay. Let's stand in this together. I'd like you to watch that and tell me what you see just to learn what their eyes look like. Good point. Or e even ask a bunch of questions. So I, I was given a gift many years ago where I had that experience with a, uh, 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 Mr. Awada, who worked for Ono for 20 years. And he stood in that circle with me and was just firing question after question after question at us. And, um, and you know, everybody was running to get him the answers to the questions he was asking, and he'd go, <laughs> 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 and, uh, and Reiko didn't need to interpret that. <laughs> um, but you know, what I learned was that he was giving me a stream of consciousness of the questions he was asking himself. And, you know, that's an important skill for a learner to have. It was probably a pattern. There's probably yeah. a pattern to what he was asking. And that's what he yeah, was, was what, to. Yeah. Yeah. What's the rationale behind every emotion that he saw it was really where he was going with it. Why is he doing that? What's the necessity? And he was really going through, if you think about it, he was going through the job methods questions not that not that formally but it was the same basic structure why is this necessary what is the purpose over and over and over again and he wasn't really interested in excuses because he's been doing this for by that point 40 years he knows that none of that is necessary he wouldn't be asking about it he wants me to see that sure and sure. um that was a that was one of those great lessons that kind of went on a time fuse and i realized a couple of years later oh you know, he wasn't interested in the answers because he was teaching me the questions. Right. 
Uh, and I always say that a good teacher continues to teach you after his death. Wow, great point. Great point. Uh, and so sometimes, coming back to your question, you know, when do I break away from the board? Let's go see. Uh, Tim, and I, my default is always if a learner is struggling, we have to go back to the current condition. What do don't we, we know? Do we fully understand What can't it? we see? Yeah. What, yeah. You know, Steve Spears, one of my favorite quotes from him, Steve Spear with one S, is uh, the root cause of all problems is ignorance. We don't understand it. And right. that's a really, really good approach. Root cause of all problems is ignorance. Yep. That's, I'm going to lock that one away. <laughs> I think that's yeah. good advice. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. Um, and, and I've seen it there. Usually I get it. And there's some videos out on the YouTube channel. The audience can, can watch uh, Beth and I are going back and forth. Um, but you hear I'm stuck. I'm glad you're back yeah. because I'm stuck. And yeah. it's a sign of what you just said, you know, admitting yeah. that. I'm ignorant of the, uh, sometimes it's I'm ignorant of the target condition. I've asked, yeah. ha have you set an experiment in motion that all the parameters are written and put in place just like the target condition? Have you attempted that? Yeah. Explored yeah. what happens? And most yeah. of the time the answer is no. But we've been yeah. going around obstacles and brainstorming and trying things and trying yeah. things, but we haven't really tried the target condition yet. Yeah. And they'll say, well, it won't work. And I'm going to say, yeah, but why? Uh, well, I just know that it won't. Well, then let's try it. Because we can always put it back. Anything you can put in, you can put, you can take back. So find a way to do it non-destructively. Even if you have to simulate it in cardboard, you pull out of our 3P tools. Let's try running to it. And let's learn what gets in our way. Exactly. That's the beauty of the 3P process is I can mock the whole thing up in cardboard and we can run hundreds of iterations in a fraction of the time. Exactly. And I can fix things with a box knife. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then uh, people in the other side of the uh, continuous improvement world will say, well, COD is too slow or it's, it's too, it, you know, it takes too long or anything. Well, that that's all in the hands of the coach and the experimenter um, mm -hmm. that's, that's doing it. You know, you don't have to, you know, fully rearrange an entire line, uh, disrupt production and, um, and cause some, some failures, obvious failures in your <laughs> the process. You, yeah. you can do a lot of things simulated, uh, and do yeah. rapid. And that's not keep, yeah. Keep the blast radius small. There you go. There you go. Blast um, radius. So that's what Mike says, isn't it? Sometimes yeah. keep the blast yeah. radius yeah. <laughs> yeah. minimal. Yeah. 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 It's very good. Well, Mark, I've enjoyed, uh, getting the insight from you today. There's a lot of uh, nuggets I'm sure our audience can pick out of, uh, of what we've been talking about. I think one of the biggest ones for me is the root of all problems is ignorance. I, th I think I'm going to carry that one uh, as a torch <laughs> going forward yeah. as, as I start to think in the right way, uh, you know, explaining sure. to the people in the right way rather than calling them ignorant yeah. and just saying, Hey, we're, we're ignorant of the process. We need to learn more. Yeah. Let's go and see yeah. together. Let's yep. go and see. So uh, thank you for, for coming on. Any final final words or advice that you would have for those of us still learning uh, this process and, and yeah, we're all still it? learning it. <laughs> yeah, honestly, if you're not if you're not don't feel some anxiety, you aren't learning. And I think that's the key here. If you think you're really good, then you're stuck. Yeah, you plan. Um, yeah, yeah, and you know that's coming back to Dunning Kruger. The real experts start to doubt their capability because they know there's so much more. So grab something else, set a target condition and learn it. Exactly. Exactly. I'd rather you go after it and do some action. And Steve yeah. says sometimes, Steve Medlin, I've heard him say, you know, if I come back or if I'm doing periodic or daily remote coaching and stuff and, and you haven't done anything for a couple of days, you know, I can't fix nothing. I can coach yep. and correct incorrect thinking or, or lack of looking at obstacles fully or vagueness. But if you've done nothing, I, I can't coach nothing. And yeah. so that's. Well, yeah, but I can ask what got in your way of doing anything. <laughs> sure. And come right back around because is that not an obstacle? Great. What's, what, do we, what experiment can we run to work on that? Sure. Exactly. Good point. And that's a, you can always bring it back into the framework. And that's Good the cool point. thing about it. Good point. Good point. Well, thank you again, Mark, um, 
folks. I want you, uh, as always, I tell them, I guess, stay safe. Uh, you're out there oh, in yeah. Ever, Everett, Washington, right? Yes. So stay safe. Uh, I know that that area of the state of Seattle was a hot spot. I know you, have, you guys have been through a yeah. lot out there, but uh, just uh, praying for you guys, your, your safety and those the support system you have around you to stay virus free and, and take all the precautions. So we wish you the best and thank you for coming on. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely.